as we dedicate the building and as we spend time really just recognizing not only everyone who joined in, but ultimately our, our thanksgiving and our, our, our praise and worship belong to our God. And we pray that this building would be, as we said, to further his kingdom. Really, God would use to further his kingdom to bring glory to himself by rescuing, redeeming, and renewing sinners like, like you and I. And so for the next just few minutes here, I want to remind ourselves why we are here, what we are doing uh, the building is new, but the mission of God is ancient. I think it'd be tempting for church leaders and for, for churches in general to have something new like this, to have a new building, uh, and then try to refocus or reevaluate, possibly move in a different direction because of something like this. And, and although new methods and new ways to connect with people is a good thing, the problem is we have something new. We don't want to change the mission. We don't want to change the message I heard a long time ago, someone once said, methods are many, principles are few. Methods always change, but principles do. So we thought it would be a good time to really look back at our mission statement and to reaffirm the purpose of King's Chapel. And then as we do, we're going to look at discipleship today just for a little bit. Next two weeks, we'll look at discipleship, what it means to be a disciple maker, what is a disciple. And then we will, in the beginning of October, jump into the book, uh, The Gospel According to Luke, and we'll look through that book step by step or verse by verse, chapter by chapter for a good amount of time. So we'll be in the gospel according to Luke. Now, there are some churches, and I'm not going to name any names. It's not for me to do. I'm not trying to put anybody down. But there are churches, church leaders, who focus on getting people in the door by promising them that as you come and hear from God, as you worship God, that your goals and your focus, along with you know, good music and encouragement, will get you to reach your full potential. So how can we as a church, how can we as leaders serve you so that you have all that God has for you? In other words, the message is really about you, and God is the best means for you to get what you're striving for, to get your full potential. Unfortunately, from a scriptural point of view, where God has revealed himself according to his word, that's completely upside down. God is not the best means for you and I to reach our ends. He is the chief end of man, and we live for his glory. And if the message is God is the best means to achieve your ends, we have turned the story of the Bible, we've turned the, the gospel upside down. We must not be man-focused, but God-focused. And when, when, when a man or a woman's full potential is the, is the goal of ministry, the, the preached word and, and the music that's being sung and, and the work of the church is not focused on God, his glory, the gospel, or Jesus Christ. It, it is man-driven. Now, that's not to say that the ministry of the church, in part, um, or part of its intention is to help you and I to grow into maturity. Grow into being more Christ-like. We see that in Romans 8. Okay, we saw that in Colossians over the summer. We studied the book of Colossians together. Paul said in Colossians 1.28 that he preached and proclaimed Christ. How? By warning everyone, teaching everyone with all wisdom that, he says, we might present everyone mature in Christ. He says, that's what I struggle and toil all about, maturing in Christ, that you would grow in wisdom and power through the gospel. But what Paul said prior to that, if you remember in chapter 1, verse 27, he said that God chose them to, to make known the, the great mystery among the Gentiles, which is the riches of God's glory. He says, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this ministry, of this mystery, excuse me, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, that the glorious one himself, the Lord Jesus, and our union with him and his, his presence in our life gives us security and hope and provides for us uh, the future glory that awaits us. See that in chapter 1, verse 12 of Colossians. No wonder that Paul goes on to write to the Colossian church and he tells them, so whatever, excuse me, so what, 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 whether you eat or drink, so whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. Eat, drink, or whatever you do. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. The ultimate goal, therefore, must be the glory of God. And this is not something out of the New Testament like Paul just picked it up, the apostle. Isaiah 43 says, bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who's called by my name, whom I created for my glory. Are we created for my glory? Psalm 96 says, declare his glory among the nations. 
God's marvelous works among all people. You see, we exist as a people. We exist as a community of God's people. We exist as a church for the ultimate goal of God's glory. That's why our mission statement says this. We exist to glorify God by living on mission with him and making disciples through gospel-centered worship, transformation, and community. You see, a mission statement is used to, to explain in a, in a succinct and a concise way, showing forth its purposes, why we exist. A mission statement helps us stay focused. It encourages us to find ways and methods to accomplish what the mission statement says and what we are accomplishing. It defines for all of us what we do. It helps us to achieve that which we are setting out to do. In other words, a mission statement is really the springboard of, of, of what a church does, how it does it, why it does it. And we exist, as it says here, and Colossians, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 10 as well, for the glory of God. We exist for the glory of God. Westminster Shorter Catechism, uh, question number one, what is the chief end of man? What's the chief end of man? A man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. John Piper says, the chief man of uh, chief by God by enjoying him forever. What does it mean to glorify God? What, what does glory really mean? Doxozo in, in the Greek. The word literally means weightiness, value, ultimate honor. God's glory, therefore, is, is his infinite and intrinsic value. His, his moral excellence, excellence, his beauty, his greatness, his preeminence, his, his surpassing worth that he has in himself above all living things, all created things, all things in all the universe. And he created us for his glory, to, to love him, to treasure him as the infinite valued and worthy thing and person, I should say, above all things. Creation with a purpose, to bring him glory. Reflecting his goodness, his greatness, his glory, his beauty to the world. That's what we created for. In fact, if you have your Bibles, you'll see in Genesis 1 and 2 that God created us in the image and likeness of God as created beings, as worshipers. And God gives us one another. He gives us family. He gives us food. He gives us all that is provision. And everything was meant in Genesis 1 and 2 as an act of worship. This constant and continuous worship and responding to the glory of God. His goodness, his faithfulness, his kindness. That's the ens- If you want to know what the essence of worship is, it is God revealing himself to us as the most glorious being in the universe. And we respond with adorations and reverence and worship. Being content and fulfilled and satisfied in God. For God alone is the all-satisfying, glorious one who captures the heart, redeems and satisfies the heart. It was John Piper who said, God's overflowing joy in his own glory is the root and basis of our joy in his own glory. God is so exuberant about his glory that he makes, it, he makes its display the goal of all he does. Therefore, so should we, end quote. And when God gets the glory family, we get what? Come on, say it out loud. Joy. But we see in Genesis 3 that man sinned, and and Adam and Eve uh, sinned against God, and they rebelled against God. Right? We see that. And, and, And they wanted to be their own saviors, their own lords. They wanted to do things their own way. They didn't trust God. And everything began to unravel. Sin entered the world, disease and brokenness and social injustice, hatred, and all kinds of evil entered the world in Genesis 3. Romans 5 tells us just as sin came into the world through one man, it was Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. And you read in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, you'll see beauty, glory, then you see sin, then you see Adam running away from God, running from the presence of God. And we've been doing the same thing ever since. We run from his presence. Here at King's Chapel, we don't define sin simply as breaking the commands of God. Although that's part of it, sin is not just breaking the divine rules, like murder, lying, and stealing. Sin, we, we, we see in Scripture, is not just doing bad things, but what? Making good things, ultimate things. We have idols, all of us, that we sacrifice to, we, we're dedicated to. It's really breaking the first commandment, that shall have no other God before me. 
And when Adam and Eve sinned, they ran and they tried to find pleasure and joy and, and ultimate glory in other things. And even good things like, like family and children and grandchildren, now that I have them, uh, marriage, kids, all those things, when they become the ultimate purpose for your life, seeking value to justify oneself outside of God, it's called idolatry, and all of us have that issue. Adam ran. Read Genesis 3. Adam ran. And he ran from the presence of God. And God went after Adam. And he goes after Adam. He says, where are you, Adam? He knows where he is. What God is showing is that he has a, a heart for people. It's, it's, it's showing the, the missionary, the first glimpse of the, of the missionary heart of God. Genesis 3.8 says this after the fall, after the sin. They, Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord, Lord God, walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord called to him, Adam, where are you? And we see the missionary heart of God, that he's the initiator. He, he's the one that pursues a relationship with his creation, even though we run and rebel. And God seeks after Adam. If you read the story, Adam and Eve cover themselves for their nakedness and their shame. And what does God do? God steps in and he kills an animal, a foreshadow of, of Christ who will die and shed his blood. And an animal is killed and the skins are taken and God clothes Adam and Eve. They try to cover their own shame and God says, no, you can't. I have to do that for you. And in the midst of, of Genesis 3 and the brokenness of sin and uh, brokenness of man when sin enters the world, God steps in in the middle of chaos in Genesis 3.15 and makes a promise to the world. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between evil, brokenness, the serpent, and the woman. I'll put enmity between you and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. In other words, God said, I'm going to send a savior one day. And although his heel would be bruised, he would crush the head of the enemy. Everything from there, Genesis 3.15, moving forward, is, is, is about God keeping his covenantal promise to reveal his glory to the world through the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Abraham called out of a pagan land to a place that God would show him, and God makes a covenant with him. I'll give you a piece of land, I will give you a large lineage, and I will give you the Lord himself will come from your offspring who will bless the whole world. God calls the people out of Egypt, takes them across into the promised land, makes a covenant with Moses at Sinai. And all throughout the Old Testament, whether it's delivery from Egypt, whether it's the Old Testament prophets, they're all pointing to a day, we saw this in Isaiah, that a light would shine out of God's people a light will come, and the Messiah will have a bright light and will, the, will come and rescue the people of God. The temple, Solomon builds a temple. I'm sure you know this. But when, when the temple was done and Solomon has a prayer of dedication, all right, there's a, a dedication of the temple that was just built. This is what he says. When a foreigner, or likewise, when a foreigner who is not your people Israel, come from a far country for the sake of your great name, your mighty hand, that's the glory of God, and your outstretched arm, when he comes and prays toward this house, hear from heaven your dwelling place, and do according to all which the foreigner calls you. Right? In order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name, they will see your glory, that's the point, and reverence you or fear you, do as do your people Israel, that they may know that this house that I built is called by your name. In other words, when people come and gather to worship you, may your glory be seen. God has always been about displaying his glory to the universe. And where his infinite glory is displayed and demonstrated most clearly in all of creation is on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is where the infinite love of God meets the holy justice of God. Where sin and rebellion was punished, justice was satisfied, and love and grace and mercy was extended to undeserved sinners like you and me. This is such an important piece. And one of the passages that I love to read to display this, uh, to, to, to show forth God's glory in the cross is 2 Corinthians. I have it up on the screen. 2 Corinthians says this in chapter 4, verse, uh, verse 4 and verse 6. 
in their case, those, those who are, are not responding to the gospel, the unbelievers, in their case, the God, small g, not the God of creation, the God we make up in our own mind, in their case, the unbelievers, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from what? Seeing the light of the gospel, what? Of the glory, the infinite worth and value of Christ, who is the image of God. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, Genesis, has now shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory, the intrinsic value and weightiness, knowledge of the glory of God in where? The face, the presence, the person of Jesus Christ. See, family, Jesus Christ, who is the gospel, is the embodiment of the glory of God. His perfect life, his substitutionary death, his resurrection from the grave displays the intrinsic and, and, and infinite glory and majesty and value of God. His worthiness, his greatness, his preeminence, his unsurpassing value we see in the cross. In the work of Jesus. In fact, when Jesus' ministry began, it was right after his baptism um, and, and, and after his inauguration of his earthly ministry, Mark tells us that he shows up on the scene and he says what? The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. You see, the gospel is the good news that the king has come. That the king of the kingdom has Come, the living God, the creator God, the king of the universe has stepped out of heaven's glory in the person of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who died and rose again. That's the gospel. He becomes our substitute, taking on himself the rightful punishment we deserve, satisfies justice, and at the same time expressing and demonstrating and calling all people to come to the love of God, come to the grace of God. It's available for you if you turn from your sin and repent and believe the gospel. And through the gospel, we bring glory to God. I want you to hear that this morning. That's what we're all about. Through the gospel, by loving him, by treasuring him as infinitely valued and worthy of, above all things. And that's something we don't keep to ourselves. We declare it to the world so that other people can bring him glory. We exist to glorify God by living on mission in making disciples. That's what it's all about. And our mission statement is meant to keep us on track. And, and we do that, we bring him glory, as our mission statement says, and the scripture says, by making disciples, having other people join us in bringing him glory. That's what Paul meant in 2 Corinthians 4. The very presence, the very purpose, and the very uh, person of Christ is, is the expression of the glory of God and the gospel. Bring him glory, making disciples, demonstrating, declaring the gospel. Now, when you get to Matthew 28, many people, we see that, and we took our mission statement partly from this as well. Matthew 28 is called the Great Commission, and it is a Great Commission, um, but it's not a new concept. We're going to talk about this more in the next couple of weeks. God has always been about revealing his glory, sovereignty to all the nations. So in, in some ways, Matthew 28 isn't new, and in some ways it is. We read Matthew 28, it says this. Jesus came to them. He said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. All authority is mine. Go therefore, that's the command. I mean, that's the participle, as you are going. And make disciples, that's command. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Then I want you to teach them to observe all I have commanded you, which begins with making disciples. And behold, I am with you always. I'll be with you. I'm in you, I'm with you, even to the end of the age. So in the Old Testament, this was pointed toward the glory of God in the coming of the Messiah. And now in the New Testament, he came, he died, he rose, and still about his glorious redemptive work. Everything in the Old Testament fulfilled. Christ has come, and he's calling his people, everyone, to repent, believe, and to what? Follow Jesus. That's what a disciple is. A disciple is someone who, 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 who hears the gospel and responds by faith to believe the gospel, but not only believe the gospel, and now listen, a disciple is someone who follows Jesus, okay? And one of the clearest descriptions of what it means to be a disciple, what it means to be a Christ follower, really, and we'll talk about this again in the next couple of weeks, what it means to be a Christian, Matthew chapter 4. While walking by the Sea of the Galilee, he saw two brothers. Jesus. Simon is called Peter and Andrew's brother, casting net into the sea for they were fishermen. And he said to them, real simple, follow me 
and I will make you fishers of men. A disciple follows Jesus. He's alive and well. They, they, they follow Jesus. It's that simple. Jesus leads, we follow. Follow means we recognize his lordship, his, his, his leadership, his mastership in our life. He initiates, he guides, in turn, we follow his direction, his leadership. John 12 says, if anyone serves me, Jesus is saying, if anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Okay? So let me bring this together. At King Chapel, we believe that every follower of Jesus, every disciple of Jesus, is a missionary. Joining God on what God is doing, declaring his glory through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what? We get to participate. It's like go to work with dad every day. It was God, Paul says, through Christ, God created through his son, reconciling us to himself and gave us, he's talking about the church, the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins or their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of what? Reconciliation, be reconciled to God. Verse 20, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. We don't speak our message, we speak for him. His message, his purposes. Ambassadors of Christ, making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And that is through the gospel. And that is what God is doing, and that is what we're doing, and that is what we want God to do through us. Jesus said, follow me. That's the turn to follow him. And notice what he says next. I will make. Whose job is it? Who's really working in us? It is our job to preach the gospel, but it is Jesus who is calling us to follow him. And then he says, I will make you. Uh, that, that's my purpose for your life. I, I will make you fishes of men. That's what he's doing. In other words, a disciple of Jesus, someone who comes to faith, has their sins forgiven, redeemed from the curse, sin, death, and hell, and his ultimate purpose is to reflect his glory by calling other people to follow Jesus. How do we do that? By joining him on mission. Mission to love and to reach lost, the lost and heart, uh, heart, hurting world. Man, we were fishers of men. Peter and Andrew, up to that time, they were what? Fishermen of what? Fish. <laughs> Throw out the net, wait, fish would come in. They would gather up, pour it into the boat, off to the market, right? Now Jesus said, no, I'm changing all that. We're going to be fishing men. New purpose. Live it out, participating in what God is doing, bringing salvation to the world through the message and the, and the work of Jesus. And if you're a disciple of Jesus, you're a Christian here this morning, the question is not, are you a follower of Christ? The question is, are you ignoring his call or are you obeying his call to live on mission? Live on mission with the one who said in Mark, for even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve. He's serving and give my life as a ransom for many. Not just trusting him, it's following him is the message of the gospel. And we, we talk about this here at Kings a lot, the missio day. We throw around Latin word, try to make us look smart, or me smart anyway. Um, it really just means, the missio day means the sending of God. Jesus said in John 17 and John 20, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And that's the good news, right? That God sent the Son. That God the Father sent God the Son to be a sin-bearing substitute who died on the cross, rose from the dead, taking the wrath we deserve on himself. And redeeming us. And, and the cross is God's message to us that I love you. Despite your faults and, and, and your warts and your scars, I love you. And, and then he reveals the glory and the glory of Christ is our treasure. Forgiveness and redemption. Reconciliation. And we get to have relationship with God. It was C.S. Lewis who captured really what the problem is. That we're not looking after the glory of God. He really, he really captures it well. Um, and why people are blind to the glories and satisfying, all satisfying Christ. Why is that? He says this. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. He says, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased, end quote. H have, you, have you tasted the infinite glory of God? Or is your soul still 
not at rest, still wandering around looking for unconditional love, meaning, and purpose. The answer is forgiveness of sins, reconciliation with your God. The answer is the gospel. And that's why we exist to love people, to love others, to serve others, to show them the kindness and mercy of God and look for ways to share the message of the good news of the gospel, his redeeming love. And that's our hope for this building, that we would use this building to further his kingdom through our participation with him as we make disciples of all nations. Now, he does the forgiving. He does and he gives new life, but we're responsible to make the good news known and to make disciples of all nations. We'll see again that next week more so. So, wrap it up this way. <clears throat> the van, you guys can come on up. Let, let me say this, family. Here's our mission statement. Number one, someone who hears the call of Christ to turn from their sins and to repent, to turn from following the world, to turn from following uh, their own desires and to begin to follow Jesus, trusting in his finished work on the cross and the message of redemption and rescue and salvation that he offers. Christ died for sin, rose for sin, and that call is to drop it all, follow Jesus. That's number one. A disciple is someone who responds to the message of the gospel. A disciple, number two, are those who are listening and growing and learning and living out the teaching of Christ. As we follow him, he's teaching us. He's alive and well, as I said. Gospel-centered discipleship always resounds around the person and the work of Jesus. You don't want to be my disciple. <laughs> you want to be Jesus' disciple. And lastly, disciples are followers who communicate the gospel to others. Respond to the call, grow in the gospel, and then communicate the gospel to others. Demonstrating, declaring the gospel of reconciliation to people. So discipleship, and that's the way the Bible teaches. Discipleship is those who are making disciples who then go and make disciples who then go and make disciples. It's a continuing process. That's why part of our mission statement is we make disciples through gospel-centered worship, person and work of Jesus, right? Transformation, that's the learning and growing and applying the truth to our lives. And then community, we gather together and then we live on mission. That's our mission statement. And every person in this room who is a follower of Christ, who come to know Jesus through repentance and faith, can point to someone that was instrumental, who understood the mission, who shared the gospel, maybe a hundred times until someday, one day, God opened your heart. So, let's do this. Name... And thank you. That's all we're looking for, okay? So I'm going to start. And you just stand up and say it. I'm going to say, thank you, Bill Bascom. He led me to faith. Somebody else, stand up and just say thank you to whoever it was that shared the faith with you. Thomas Gaines. Anybody else? I know you're all here, but go ahead, Christine. My wife. David Jeremiah. Yeah. That's what it's about. Sharing, loving, drawing people, you being used of God, showing love, caring for people, and sharing the good truth of the gospel so that their sins can be forgiven. They can grow in love and then be sent out to make disciples. Amen, family? That's what we're about. That's what we hope happens here. Let's stand together. Father, may we never get to the place where we are only focused inward. Yes, we are a church that love and care for one another, serve and, and uh, just serve one another and love one another. Yes, that, that is something we must do. But there's a world that is hurting out there as well. 
And God, may we never get so focused that we don't see the hurting people around us. And God, we pray that this building and our lives, that we would grow as, as Christ's followers and, and do what he's doing. He's, he is seeking and saving the law. So God, we want to be a part of what you're doing. Help us, God, to love others. Help us, God, to, be in, to, to care for others. And then help us, God, to, to open our mouths and share the good news of the gospel with others. That they may know Christ and they may have their sins forgiven. That they may go out and make disciples. You said, Lord Jesus, you will build your church. The gates of hell will not prevail against the building of your church. But you told us to make disciples. May, may we not lose sight of that. And Father, we just pray in the next coming months and years ahead that this place would be used to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, that, Lord, we would be about making disciples who make disciples. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.